This is Wicked Problems. I'm Richard Delavan. So the first time I heard about this, it reminded me of a concept that was in Kim Stanley Robinson's The Ministry for the Future. One of the central concepts is this thing called the carbon coin. And so it sounded a little bit like what you were describing. The idea is to regulate the money supply based on the underlying carbon assets. And the idea, therefore, is that as people go about their everyday economic activity, buying coffee or you know, buying food in restaurants and just being active in the community, the more people adopt the currency, and the more need there is for the money supply. And so the dream is to get people to fund climate solutions doing things they're already doing. Not telling them they have to eat bugs, stop driving, don't fly, don't use lights, or the things that people looking to delay climate action spin into conspiracy theories to whip up fear and often votes. So what if every time you paid for a coffee, you were directly funding climate action? What if, as in Kim Stanley Robinson's The Ministry for the Future, we literally hotwired the financial system so it would do that? What if instead of gold reserves or just the government-issued debt that backs most currencies today, we decided that the thing we valued most was fixing the climate? From Croesus, the king of Lydia in modern Turkey, was credited with inventing money, to COVID, where in the face of an emergency we remembered we kind of really do when we have to what we want with money. And it's an idea, an idea that people came up with, and it stuck around because it was a good enough operating system you could build lots of other applications on top of it at scale. I sat down with Joe Pretorius, who thinks money is due for another refresh. He's one of the founders behind Toco, digital currency that's not just a medium of exchange, but a powerful tool, potentially, for environmental sustainability. Backed by carbon mitigation assets, held in sort of a central bank. But how do you make a new currency? And is the idea of money backed by carbon credits sci-fi, or does it just seem strange because no one's done it yet? Before we start, one quick thing. If you're a paid subscriber to Wicked Problems and helping support our work, thank you. If you're not yet, but you're enjoying these conversations, maybe today's the day you keep us going by throwing a bit of money in the tip jar at wickedproblems.earth. In an episode about money, I suppose it'd be kind of weird if we didn't ask. Now, here's our conversation about Toco with Joe Pretorius. I'm here with Joe Pretorius, the, one of the founders of the Carbon Reserve. Joe, thanks for joining us on Wicked Problems. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. So look, I my question is, what is a TOCO? How many dollars is it going to take for me to get one? And when can I use it to buy a coffee in Zurich? <laughs> That's a lot of a uh, lot of questions there, Richard. Yeah. Right. So what a TOCO is essentially it's a you know independent carbon backed currency. So the currency is backed by carbon mitigation assets. Those assets are typically you know any kind of tradable certificate such as a carbon credit or a carbon avoidance or a carbon mitigation. And one TOCO represents effectively one ton of carbon dioxide equivalent that has been mitigated, either removed from the atmosphere or avoided. The exchange rate for the the, for the TOCO, you know, has multiple inputs. It obviously depends on the underlying and the movement of the movement of carbon pricing. And in the long term, you would expect it to creep upwards as we start seeing more demand for for carbon mitigation. But right now, we're sort of pricing that around the um, thirty euro ton mark um, at the moment. Um, it represents, of course, a portfolio of carbon mitigation assets behind it. So it's made up of, you know, both sort of natural um, carbon mitigation assets and also um, carbon technology such as you know, biochar. Or, or direct carbon capture. And it's going to be available in Zurich from next week. You can download the app at you know the Apple Store or at the Android Google Store. It's under Toko's app. And that will allow you to purchase a currency based on based on carbon and send it to your friends. You can also offset your, your monthly footprint by, by retiring it, retiring it there. And we're working tirelessly to try and get our first merchants on board. Obviously, once once the app goes live, there's no immediate merchants that will be, be taking it. But we've got a team on the ground that's going to start adopting merchants. And you'll be able to see on the app, there's a little button in a map that will allow you to find like-minded merchants who's, you know, has come to the same conclusion as people who think that carbon, you know, is a good basis for money. There will be merchants out there that are happy to accept it. Well, 
Joe, that was great. Tour de force and trying to get a lot of questions answered in a very <laughs> short period of time. But let's take a step back. So let's uh, let's understand what we're talking about here. So the idea is that TOCO is a unit of currency that's backed by assets that are related to carbon mitigation, right? So, and I, I guess I want to understand the boundary conditions for that in terms of what we what is and is not kind of considered in, in play uh, for those things. But it's the idea that this could be the basis for a currency. Now we've seen lots of experiments with local currency, you know, in, in different places around the world. What makes this different other than the carbon aspect of it, but just as a unit of exchange different from, you know, I'm, I'm based here in the UK. So, you know, like somewhere in Totnes in Devon, where, where they would have a, a local currency that you can, you know, use in different merchants, you know, you know, works in the little towns like that. How is it, how is what you're talking about different? How does it scale? Well, I think the underlying is obviously what's different. I mean, most currencies that, you know, well, most currencies in the world today are, are fiat currencies. So they really, you know, exist only because, you know, governments enforce legally that they need to be accepted as, as legal tender. And their expansion is primarily driven by an expansion of, of debt markets, right? In this case, you know, the idea is to regulate the money supply based on the underlying carbon assets. And the idea, therefore, is that as people go go about their everyday economic activity, um, trying to transact in carbon, buying coffee or you know, buying food in restaurants, and just being active in the in the community, the more people adopt the currency, uh, the more need there is for the money supply. And for the money supply to expand, you need to expand the underlying um, carbon mitigation um, activity that that supports it. So as more and more people adopt the currency, they are effectively placing a demand on on the carbon on the carbon markets, and mm -hmm. therefore incentivizes you know guys who run carbon mitigation projects to invest in more and expand that that market to to support it. So I guess simplistically, you know, I think you know it's sort of better money for better world to put it in a you know in marketing speak because um, you are able to to satisfy your money needs on an everyday mm -hmm. basis but in this manner it becomes very easy for you to have make meaningful climate impact every day without it really costing the individual anything there's no real additional costs involved very little friction but we are now harnessing the actual human need for being an economic actor and tying that back to environmental goals and satisfying that. Mm. So it's kind of, I think it's just, it's, I don't know what's the right word for it, sort of moral money in a way. Okay. No, that, that yeah, that's a, that's a good term for it. So, and I just, I'm just trying to get my head around how the mechanism actually works. So basically there's a nonprofit called the Carbon Reserve, which essentially acts as a central bank, right? And holds assets against which this currency is being issued. It's like, just tell me, stop me when I don't, when I'm going off track here, but just yeah, so, you're right so far, so far. Cool. Okay. So, and therefore there's a limited finite supply of assets that is backing, you know, this particular currency, right. And the supply of those assets that are under management by the carbon reserve is meant to increase over time. That's the social good that's being promoted. How, who pays for it? Who pays for these, you know, kind of, you know, DAC projects or afforestation in Brazil projects or, you know, whatever the, the things are that are going to go into that portfolio. Who Who is actually putting up the money for that? How does it actually pay for increased supply of these yeah, well, projects? Well, it's actually quite simple. I mean, this is sort of the beauty of harnessing the technology of money, if you will, to translate this demand. So essentially what happens is, you know, as people want to purchase more more tokens, they need to exchange their fiat currencies, obviously, for for TOCO itself. Mm -hmm. The carbon reserve accepts that fiat currency. It issues the TOCO on, on it issues the TOCO into in to the user or the community that, that is demanding TOCO. It then uses that fiat currency that it has issued to go to the market and purchase carbon assets directly from the market and it transforms that fiat currency into the carbon asset that, that the carbon reserve Holds. So as the TOCO supply, gen as the demand for the TOCO increases, the carbon reserves absorbs fiat. It uses that fiat and then uses that fiat to apply it into the carbon market. And that's how it sort of acts as, let's call it an agent, if you will, or a sort of central intermediary surface on behalf of the whole community out there to transmit demand for, you know, more expansive carbon mitigation. Right. And so the first time I heard about this, it reminded me of... 
a concept that was in Kim Stanley Robinson's The Ministry for the Future, which has been like basically, a, you know, we ask guests to come on this show for recommendations of books that have been, or shows or films or whatever that have inspired them. And they're thinking about climate tech and all the, Almost half of people have suggested, you know, Ministry for the Future as being one of their their reads that inspired them yeah. to you know look be in the space. And of course, one of the central concepts of that is used as the kind of carrot as opposed to the stick to move kind of carbon climate action in Stanley Robinson's book is this thing called the carbon coin. And so it sounded a little bit like what you were describing. I went back and actually just reminded myself that the original idea was actually from an Australian engineer called Dalton Chen. That's who wrote, correct. Who wrote a paper, and then you know he's now got a crowd called the Global Carbon oh, Reward, reward. Um, and they're they're doing a very different thing, as I understand it. I mean, they're he's actually Dalton Chen is going around actually trying to convince central bankers to change their remit to include carbon mitigation or you know abatement as being you know kind of part of the reason they should exist, and also then harnessing the the power of, of fiat currencies at scale and the idea that you know he's looking at big global talking to the bank of england talk to the fed talk to mm. whoever whereas you guys have taken a very different approach if i'm not mistaken and actually as opposed to chen you've actually got people who have actually been trade actually been trading mm. in toko in stellenbosch in south africa correct so tell us a little bit about that experiment yeah so yeah maybe just on dalton and and the mm. carbon coin reward i think you know underlyingly our concept is is you know they're, they're very similar and and there's been other scholars that has you know thought about you know this is the way that you can internalize externalities in the economy you know perfectly is by you know somehow tying our money supply to mm -hmm. you know the preservable boundaries of, of of our planet and i don't think there's a big you know sort of philosophical difference between what the global carbon reward is doing and what we're doing I just think that if you look at the last 30 years that we've had in terms of the carbon markets as, as they are right now, those carbon markets are, are a massive failure, right? Mm. They are you know, fragmented, they're liquid, they're opaque. And I mean, if you read the newspapers, you'll, you know, see that there's, you know, significant credibility concerns among them. And that really means that they remain very small and the pricing there is very, very soft. So it's not really moving the dial at all. And if you, if we, we're 28 cops in and annual emissions are, are still up by 60%. So the carbon markets and trying to find a price of carbon has failed. And I think our contention is that if you look at the root cause of why they failed, it's because they're very poorly designed, they're very poorly governed and badly supported. And that is because that our governance, governments and institutions have failed to find the consensus that, that we need for them to create an effective pricing scheme for carbon, right? And but when you when you unpack that, you understand why, right? It's you know at a global level, you've got all of these competing national interests. There are several sovereign concerns, and especially when it comes to climate change, there's these skewed vulnerabilities that exist that that I think makes it impossible for governments to find the kind of cooperation and agreements you'll need to run this to run this effectively. And you know, the governments are sort of you know they become self-interested actors themselves. So they're kind of transported into this tra tragedy of the commons themselves. Mm. Um, and I think that's the same thing when you start thinking about trying to change the way that the world thinks about money and tying this, you know, tying the basis of money to something like, you know, carbon mitigation is that we just don't believe that governments will be able and central banks will be able to act fast enough. There's a first mover disadvantage in that implied in that entire system. I mean, who's going to be punching a hole in their economy and saying, well, I'm going to limit the amount of money I'm going to, you know, supply the market because we haven't reached the carbon mitigation levels that, that we needed to when, you know, other countries are willing. And, and, and so for them to move forward, I think you'd have to find cooperation at that level. Right. And that will just take far, far too, far too long. I mean, you'll know this better than me. We're out of our carbon budget by 2030, right? I mean, that's, um, that's what we're facing. So, so we've we've sort of taken the view that you need to find a solution that bypasses these institutions and that mm -hmm. you can put the ability to take climate action today into the hands of every economic actor, into the hands of everyday man out there and democratize the efforts to to stimulate and incentivize carbon carbon mitigation. And hence we have tried to develop the infrastructure and the platform to power exactly the launch of such a carbon based currency and say to the market, okay, well, the greater market people out there, you decide. 
By choosing this currency, you're, opt you're opting to divert money need away from fiat naturally mm. into a carbon-based currency. So in a way, the market therefore acts as an allocator of capital towards economic expansion versus environmental protection. And we wanted to put that power in people's hands. And we've developed all of this infrastructure that you alluded to, like a nonprofit that, ends as, that, that acts as the central the central bank for the for the monetary system. We also created a payment system so that you know it becomes anybody with an internet connection can can access it very easily and they can just transact. And then last year, yeah, as you said in in February, we took it to a small town in South Africa where I'm from. That you might tell from the from the accent, Stellenbosch. It's about 40 k's outside of outside of Cape Town. Sort of nice wine growing region, large student population, and we launched it there as a kind of test to see you know how does this how does this actually get accepted by people do they understand the understand the narrative is there enough incentive for them to take risk on a new currency if it has this sort of climate impact advantages and then also how would the sort of you know the business community look at this will the merchants accept it etc and then yes if you can get a currency going locally does it actually have have the the uptake Are you still there? Yeah, sorry, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what happened. What happened then? Sorry about that. Yeah, no, I, I just was checking my connection to make sure it wasn't something at my end. But I, I think it was my end. Sorry, where did I lose you in that in that um, rambling? I, I, no, it wasn't rambling at all. I mean, I think we were we were just getting into the the experience in Stellenbosch to be able to talk about the kind of how things went. So I think you'd set things up very nicely, the kind of community it is and, you know, the kind of setting and the experiment that, as I understand it, you were basically, you know, again, as a former startup guy myself, thinking about it in lean terms, you know, the learning you were trying to get out of it was basically trying to see what were the barriers to adoption, what would make mm. both consumers and merchants decide this was worth doing, and then, you know, what kind of numbers you were going to post. So that's kind of where I was going to go with that. Yeah, so I mean, on that, to be quite honest with you, Richard, I mean, our expectations were, were you know, probably at the low end to start start off with. Always a little bit skeptical when it comes to human nature. Sure. But the results that we got were just absolutely phenomenal and far exceeded anything that we that we ever expected. I mean, our our user growth was like sixty five percent month on month, and we eventually ended up seven months in with, you know, having, you know, attained about 30 to 35% of the addressable market of users that were using the currency. Mm. And obviously they weren't using it for high value purchases. I mean, it was sort of being used for everyday purchases of coffee, restaurants and, and bars. I think what was far more interesting to me were the, were the merchants, right? Because mm. I thought, you know, okay, this is going to be an interesting, interesting story, but we at the outset decided that you know one of the things that we need to do is we really need to incentivize merchants to to adopt this commercially. So 
we've worked very hard at trying to keep the payment system as lean as we can so we can offer really really low transaction fees that is far below sort of current credit and debit card fees and so initially the merchants sort of hopped on board for that for that reason but i think they're very quickly understood that here was this ability to build a brand connection with with their customers and a way to signal their you know their mm. sustainability credentials to the to the market and obviously what happened is as you know in in a street or a block if you will you started having merchants filling in you started finding that you know the users would start preferring the coffee shop that was accepting a currency that was making climate impact versus the coffee shop that was north. So you start created the sort of perfect environment where people had to had to come on board. Right. I think if you look at the total market that we, we, we eventually ended up with just, you know, close to half of all the merchants, but that sort of includes large corporates and large change as well. If you look at the cohort of merchants that lived in the community and, mm -hmm. you know, works there, the sort of more, you know, don't want to call them pop and mom shops because some of them are quite sizable businesses, but yeah, where the owner or the beneficial owners are present, we probably had about 82% of, of, of that kind of conversion. Right. And that, and, and that just started creating this real sort of positive vibe where we started seeing increased utility in, in, in the token. So now it wasn't only restaurants, it started being bars and nightclubs. We had laundries, we had florists accepting it. So you could do a whole range of activities quite, you know, quite comfortably. Mm -hmm. And that invited more users. And that then created, you know, further, further utility. And eventually we even had suppliers that were coming into, into Stellenbosch starting to accept the coin upstream. We had some of the employees working for some of these merchants, accepting portions of their remuneration in the in the currency. Mm -hmm. And what was really fascinating about that was like my expectation in the beginning was to say, yeah, we can get people to adopt it, but aren't we just going to see a circular sort of, we're going to sell the, you know, we're going to sell the, the toko, the toko is going to go, there's going to be one transaction to the merchant. And then, mm -hmm. you know, the merchant's going to come straight off back to the carbon reserve and we would have to give it, you know, fiat back and we have no net effect. And that was maybe true for the first month and a half. And I mean, Obviously, the merchants were testing the carbon reserve to see whether they whether they, they should pay know, out, yeah. <laughs> whether they would pay out as they yeah. were they were promising. But then they started. I mean, the, the currency started being retained naturally, and I think right. it's because you know some of the the owners could use it, you know, in hmm. in Stellenbosch further, and we started seeing the velocity of money in the in the system pick up, mm. and we've just saw a very steady increase in in right. Toko. To such an extent, actually, that we felt we were very sort of wedded to the idea initially that we needed to buy the the carbon credits and the offsets, you know, mm. in South Africa locally, because you know people are very skeptical of the carbon markets, and rightly so. And so, you know, you want to point them into, you know, there's the mangrove forest, you know, there's the wind farm. It's you can drive and you can go and see it. But uh, we initially we accumulated so many accumulated so much demand that the carbon reserve actually had you know to pivot out of south africa because we mm. couldn't find enough credible supply to support the expansion and had to start importing and buying you know buying off the international international VCM. markets yeah so we had a it, from a from a carbon mitigation impact it it even though it's a very very small let's call it experiment uh -huh. um, we managed to transmit significant demand um, into into the carbon markets over a very short period of time Okay. And so, I mean, like, those are some great stats in terms of adoption. I mean, and again, at that scale, I'm not going to ask you to get into carbon tons, you know, kind of abated or, or whatever, because again, that sits 77,000 people, as I understand, in Stellenbosch. So it's not, not the biggest community on earth. But you guys have gone, you know, you're taking this global now, right? So you're like, you're taking this on the road, and you're doing pilots in Switzerland, and I believe Denmark coming up, both interestingly outside of the Eurozone. So what was necessary for you to be able to get to the point where next week you're going to start, you know, launching this in, in Switzerland? Well, I think you know, as you point out, Stellenbosch is very small and, you know, South Africa is not, you know, it's not, let's call it a market where I think there's a whole host of other challenges that probably sit in the addressable market demographic there and climate change and, and these things are probably a bit, bit lower. And we've always felt that Europe was our, you know, natural mm -hmm. target market or the developed world where we have the disposable income. So, so yes, we're bringing it to, we, there's nothing really much required. We're bringing it to Switzerland and, and to Denmark. The, the biggest hurdle in all of these things are, are getting, you know, is the regulations. So, mm -hmm. you know, from the outset, because we're a private, you know, currency, 
and independent currency with our own payment system. We needed to make certain that we are fully regulatable, that we are fully compliant with all the local regs in, in the jurisdictions where we where we operate, you know, because we you know we're supporters of financial stability and secure banking and consumer protections and all that. If you want to roll out a system like this at scale, you're gonna to have to make certain that it's completely interoperable with you know the world's current financial infrastructure. So so yes, Switzerland was the first place where you know we've rib- where we've complied to the to, to the regulations of, of of the Swiss, and we're just busy in in Denmark. We will be ready in the next two two weeks to mm. to be able to off ramp fiat for for the toko in Denmark. Launch those two. At the moment, there's a process in Europe that's called the Mika regulations that's that's ongoing undergoing now, and we expect that to be sort of ready in July, end of August, and then we will have clarity in terms of what it is that we need to do from a re- regulatory standpoint mm. to comply with um, the European Union's directives in terms of operating private digital currencies such as ourselves. And once that is there, then we will roll out to, to Europe. But we will be making, the, we will be making the, the app available worldwide soon, mm. albeit in, in countries where we, are, where we haven't obtained regulatory approval yet. You'd only be able to, for instance, buy the TOCO to, to retire. Not be able to use it as a as a payment or a utility token for that for, for, for that matter. And, and so I, I want to come to that because again about future plans, but just in terms of how it's going to work and like some of the things you'll be looking to learn. Uh, again, you know, you've been involved in startups. You know, you've had a couple of other on the ones under your belt and fiber and lobster ink. And I've never quite got to the bottom of what that was or is, but it's basically the learning that you're trying to get out of these these pilots or these i suppose launches in switzerland and then in denmark is what i mean how many digital currencies are you competing with it's a it's a different it's different from first of all for importantly the distinction between this and crypto right so we're, we're not talking about ethereum or bitcoin where i can you know like uh, i'm just using this essentially as speculation i'm just want you know because i've heard about this etc this is a very different proposition uh, first of no, all, just to make make the distinction between what you're talking about and what people, because my people might hear what you're talking about, and say, "Oh, this is crypto." Yeah, so I mean, we try and stay stay clear of the crypto moniker. As I said to you, that you know, we're not we're not major. Well, I think philosophically, we're not necessarily aligned to you know distributed, decentralized, anonymous you know currencies. I think I mentioned to you you know in our previous talks that when you're dealing with something like climate change and something this important, you want to make certain that you don't have a system that is that is open to moral hazards, which mm-hmm. I think that anonymity and that you know that takes Se- secondly, so we are known quantities we f- we regulate as if it's a normal you know as if it's we regulate um, as if it's a normal currency or a normal mm-hmm. payment system. Don't go and hide around the decentralization nature and then obviously we are primarily m- trying to make this you know function as money and for it to function as money we are using a little bit of old school sort of you know central banking i guess philosophy in terms of how we regulate that and that we apply flexible monetary policy so we use the balance sheet of the carbon reserve to try and defend the exchange rate and also to manage the convertibility of the currency into you know into the under you know mm-hmm. into the underlying and that's why we feel that you know even though our payment system yes is built on a blockchain one that we've custom developed and the reasons we did that purely is because we like the technology because it scales so so easily but we've not adopted many of the you know of yeah. the crypto typical cryptocurrency protocols that sit sit on top of that and so the, yeah i mean because it's the decentralization and the anonymity that allows you know is the 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 big difference and what has attracted certain actors to you know become very active in in block in in, in crypto let's just and say it, and distinct from digital currency and blockchain and it invites volatility, of course. That mm. you know, two things that the that cryptocurrencies has is that the monetary policy is normally algorithmic. Mm. So it means you know it's easy for actors to you know to target that algorithm because they know how it's going to behave. And then secondly, that the fact that it's anonymous, etc., you know, allows its allows manipulation of the currency to create volatility that obviously attracts, let's call it a certain, certain type of actor, actors. certain type of actor. Yeah, exactly. We we don't need to go there. I think everybody knows what we're talking about. So. And and then in, so the regulatory environment. So I mean, but basically, this is a bit like, I guess, an Apple Pay going around and trying to get merchants to sign up for you know to be able to use that, right? And so, you know, there's a there's a labor intense process that presumably Apple went through before they, you know, it's Apple. So you're not selling a brand necessarily, but you know, the idea of it being a payments platform, 
you know, that's different. So uh, what's the market like? You're going out, you're talking to different pe pe merchants in Zurich or in Copenhagen, and you're basically saying, here's the proposition, here's why you should accept this, this digital currency. You know, what are those conversations like? Look, I think the conversations are, you know, the conversations are, are positive. I mean, we haven't had them in, you know, any sort of anger. We've had authority conversations because the, you know, the app is just not available yet to, mm -hmm. yet to use. But I think we find, we find the same thing everywhere, which is essentially to say that, yes, we're concerned about climate change. Mm -hmm. Yes, this sounds interesting. We don't necessarily understand exactly how this creates climate, climate impact. And it takes them a little bit of time to get, you know, to get their heads around it. But the fact that it's not costing them anything, the fact that it's very easy to use and the fact that it has, you know, the the stamp of approval from the authorities in I think that the answer that we're getting is, yeah, sure, why not? We'll give it, you know, we'll give it a go. We're right. I think that we we're, we're definitely finding that there really is a sense of frustration um among people in the community when it comes to climate change in that everybody wants to do something. But to act as an individual just feels so disempowering and, and, and so frustrating because there's nothing that you can do. And here is a means to come together as a community around a shared value, which is that carbon mitigation matters. And we can actually demonstrate that shared value by using it as a means of exchange between between us. And of course, the carbon reserves, you know, is there to also give the the merchants comfort that that yes we understand that the utility in the beginning is not going to be as great and that economic needs will will take place and that we will support we will support you know your fiat liquidity when and that is that is required but that we're here on a collective journey and that at some point we will start getting the network effects that will make it possible for for you to retain that currency and 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 use it you know use it in other ways so yeah so i think that the the the, the overall response is really one of positiveness we've we've not encountered the kind of skepticism that i might that we've encountered in south africa let me put it that way there's a there's a general willingness to lean into this to try and to try and help collectively to 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 solve a problem, and and that's sort of the way that we're thinking about the adoption as well, Rich. Yeah, I can see uh, you. You're back. Can you still I think. see me? I can. Hit, yeah, you're okay. back. Okay. okay. I tell you what, we we could probably, you know what, I'm, I'll just why don't we just kill our cameras, and that might make save ourselves a little bit of bandwidth. If that makes things easier, if that's all right. Let's see if that gives us any more stability. So that I I think I got all of that in the sense of like there's a lot of receptivity to the story you're telling. There's a lot of interest in seeing giving it a try, which is great. And so, what are your what are your objectives, or what do you how will you know whether you've succeeded in in this launch in you know in Switzerland and in Denmark? Like, what are the metrics you guys are going to use? The KPIs that'll say, you know, we we expect to hit this kind of target by I don't know end of the year or whatever you're doing. About, look, I don't think we have any sort of specific target like that in mind. This has been. You know, this initiative has been designed, you know, in a, in a sort of non-profit, with a non-profit hat, you know, non-profit hat on. Everything is done really low cost. And, and we're sort of providing the infrastructure and the platform out there for, for the community. We will be trying to leverage social media and doing talks and, you know, sort of very leverageable activities to to get the word out there, to explain people how it works, etc. But we, we're sort of hoping to galvanize a movement in these communities of, people who really care about the environment that align with our thinking that, you know, we need to align economic incentives with environmental goals and mm -hmm. that the you know, monetary framework is the way to do that and get people self perpetuating that and, and growing that way. And yes, we will support it on the, you know, we will support it on the ground, to, you know, to some extent to sort of, you know, create an initial cohort of merchants where um, we could demonstrate the efficacy of the, of, of the, of the solution. But I mean, the scale that we're talking, the scale that we're talking here about, I think you're going to really need a sort of groundswell of people support and have this catch the imagination of society at last and 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 put a solution in society's hands that is that is cheap and easy enough that people try and adopt this on on large scale. Right. And is, is this the first of its kind? I mean, just I should have asked that at the beginning, but like, is this in terms of like it actually being a functioning medium of exchange? backed by, you know, carbon mitigation assets. I mean, is, the, is this a world first in what you're doing? 
There's been a couple of iterations of trying to create currencies on the back of of carbon. The only ones that I'm aware of have leaned much more heavily into the, you know, into the classic sort of crypto space in, you know, creating digital assets there and then running on the crypto exchanges to try and co-opt co-opt the demand the demand right. there. In terms of, yeah, building building a currency that is transactable every day on an app alongside your Apple Pay and your Visa MasterCard with that is backed by by carbon no, I, I think it is a world first right. it's not a world first an idea but i think no. in terms of implementation and and reality it is i mean because i think that's i think that's kind of what stand makes you guys stand apart what makes me interested in kind of continuing the conversation is that it's you know people like you say people have been talking about this for a long time and there have been some frankly disreputable folks who came along i think back in 2018 and created something actually called carbon coin and you know they sort of promised to plant a bunch of trees and had just one other flavor of cryptocurrency and so i think you know the fact that you guys have gone around the the route of getting you know this fully convertible regulatory approved you know in real markets with real merchants transacting you know for real stuff as opposed to some notional bitcoin account mm. It's, you know, that, that I think is a, it's what makes this different for me and what's you know different even from all due respect to Dalton Jen, you know, somebody who's just going around making presentations to central banks and like, wouldn't it be nice if we could do this and you guys are actually doing it. And I think that's just what makes it stand apart for me. Mm. Yeah. I think you need to, you need both approaches, right? I think sure. you got to, you need the people to work on, you know, on the policy measures. I think you asked me what victory would be earlier and I gave you a, a fluffy answer. <laughs> but I think, uh, I think for me, victory would be is that if we could, in a location like Copenhagen or Switzerland, demonstrate that at scale, we can get a community galvanized around using a coin based on carbon, and that using you know flexible monetary policy to regulate the money supply so that you can actually affect and transmit that demand responsibly to carbon to carbon markets, and that there mm -hmm. is a real need by people to take this kind of action and they're happy to express it via, you know, via economic action, then I think that that will probably be a kind of beacon result that the policy wonks and the central banks and people would look at. And if that, if that's the case, and from there they decide to, you know, adopt some kind of, you know, carbon reserve system where at least a portion of the fiat money supply is based on, you know, the carbon credits that they hold on, on the central bank's um, balance, then that would be victory. If, even if we don't exist, let's say, you know, three, four years uh, down the line, but we'd managed to, to create enough of a demonstrable and practical example that this can be done and that we can get the world to change course. I think that would be victory for me. Well, I think that's a that's a terrific way of framing it. So, sorry, I, I don't know if you're you're stuck for time. I, do, I realize I think I've gone over our allotted time, but I think um, if you've got a couple more minutes, I had one or two more questions. Sure. Um, to be able to get to. So, so look, so Joe, I mean, this I think that's a really interesting. You know what you guys are doing, I think is is different, and I accept what you're saying that we need all sorts of approaches to be able to kind of run the experiment in different ways. But I think what you guys are producing in terms of data about consumer behavior, about merchant behavior is, is going to be invaluable, as you say, uh, for people who are looking for real world tests of, you know, kind of what, how people will behave when it comes to this stuff. But one of the things that people, of course, will, you know, once you get over distinguishing it from, let's say, less reputable kind of forms of, of crypto and digital currency, is that if it's, you know, there was a rash of, of media attention for Dalton Chen in the kind of, about what, three years ago at this point, kind of the beginning of 2021. So, you know, Kim Stanley Robinson's book had come out, you know, Chen was kind of doing the speaking, the speaking circuit, going, talking this stuff up and there's stuff in Mashable and there's stuff in plenty of other, you know, media outlets about the, the idea. And of course, at that time, we were also seeing in the European exchange, you know, uh, emissions trading system, you know, this huge spike, uh, which was continually going up and lasted until February of 2023 of the price of a ton of carbon on the European market, on the ETS. Now, over the last year, that price has crashed in that it's now 50%, up, you know, it's 56 a ton where it was about 112 a ton, you know, back in February 2023. So is that a problem for you guys in that the perception of 
you know, the idea that there could be a functioning market for carbon has kind of had some, you know, never mind the voluntary carbon markets in general would have had a wobble over the last year. But even the statutory markets have had this valuation crash, you know, from February 2023 to now. Is that a problem for you guys? Um, no, I don't think it's, I, I don't think it is a, it's a systemic problem. Obviously, you know, volatility on the, you know, on the underlying is always something that you're going to have to, that you're going to have to deal with and, and manage. But I think, you know, in terms of how we look at the carbon assets that we, that we hold is a, that, you know, in terms of the, the compliance markets, these, um, certificates are really allowances. So they, they are a right. They're not actually a, a carbon a carbon reduction so in terms of their mitigation value we actually rank them quite quite low and their prices might be high but we think that their you know their carbon the carbon mitigation value is actually quite quite low because they aren't they aren't really reductions or or avoidances per you know per se we focus more on the voluntary carbon market and the efforts there and projects there that work towards avoidances and and reducing atmospheric carbon and negative, you know, negative emissions. I think the biggest challenge that we are faced with there, obviously, is just this these credibility and quality concerns and integrity concerns that has plagued the voluntary carbon market, you know, over the last let's call it five or, you know, five or six six years. But our view is very much that you know those credibility and quality concerns has to do with the fact that that market is still very very tiny and fra- fragmented and sort of lives in the lives in the dark with very very little scrutiny and we we know that a lot of people are trying to work at solving the supply side um, there's the voluntary carbon market initiatives there's credible carbon quality initiatives etc that is that's trying to do all of these things but we think that demand actually if we can create sufficient demand and liquidity in that um, in that space um, then we will create enough economic incentives for uh, the participants in that market, you know, to put in the required auditing, to create the right transparency, um, to create the sort of you know marketplaces where um, this friction is 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 lowered, and we can start you know sort of you know let's you know washing out the turds from the from the you know carbon market if you, if I can put it that way, and you know start building on its on its credibility. Our approach in the short term is that we are doing, I think, you know, sort of three things to combat some of that credibility concerns. And the first one is we're taking a portfolio approach. So we want to try and pull risks for the market by buying wide so that, you know, if any single project or single credit turns out afterwards to to have had some concerns, it doesn't affect the overall, you know, the overall portfolio and the balance sheet of of the carbon reserve can take that hit on behalf of the market. The second thing that we're doing is we're taking a risk rating approach to these these assets. So we're saying that we have to recognize the fact that, you know, these are voluntary carbon markets. These markets, to a certain extent, are still in their infancy and immature. But, you know, to to try and curtail them with high barriers of entry can't possibly be the right approach, right? You've got to give people who want to invest in this space a kind of gliding path that they can come into and then work themselves up. So, so the way that we look at it is we look at projects, we look at their quality, where they come from, what their history is, et cetera. And, and then we apply, you know, sort of risk rating to it the same way that you treat, let's call it, you know, sort of corporate or country debt. And say so that certain of these things are triple A and certain of them, you know, are junk credits, but they're all doing something positive. You just need to value the, the carbon tonnage appropriately. And so we risk down, we risk discount that as we bring it into, you know, into the carbon reserve to manage that risk. And then the third thing that we're doing is we're, you know, just we've created the foundation, the portfolio is there for everybody to see. Everybody knows what the carbon reserve is doing every day. It can see exactly we publish on we publish on, on the Carbon Reserve website our holdings, how we've rated them, what they are, with linkages back to the to the projects. And we in, we invite and we encourage third parties to come and disagree with us vehemently in terms of the views that we have taken because mm-hmm. it is through that sort of market interaction I think that we get to a point where we create the kind of market transactions that will drive the that will drive the quality. And and as the quality becomes becomes more evident that spread will that spread will close. Mm-hmm. And as we generate more demand, I think the volat the, the volatility and the underlying will wash out. 
Well, I mean, I think we'll we'll be waiting with bated breath to see how the experiment plays out in, in Switzerland and then in Denmark. So we wish you guys the best of luck. Actually, one thing that you might be worth knowing, the last time I talked to somebody who was actually the father of a currency or co-father in your case, was actually Robert Mundell, looking back, the father of the euro, who I interviewed about 17 years ago when he was in Ireland for a thing. So one of the things that he, he when I, looking back at my notes in my interview with him, that he he was talking about, you know, was that some of the factors that that do, you know, make a currency in general successful. So and, and, and in thinking about that, are there any other factors in addition to the kind of groundswell of public support you're hoping to see and kind of community level support? Are there other macro factors that you think, you know, will help determine whether or not a project like yours takes off? Uh, look, I think that the biggest, I mean, our biggest concern in our, you know, in this scheme really comes down to, you know, to two things is one, can you, can you convince the public at, you know, a public at large to adopt a private currency such as, such as this, you know, just at how do you scale this narrative to get to that, to that, you know, two sided network effect. And then the second, as I just alluded to, I think that there are quality concerns in the there are quality concerns in the carbon markets as they are now. That doesn't mean that the carbon markets are, you know, should be should be disbanded. They they are the right mechanisms for um, for finding pricing for carbon and expanding it. Um, they just need to be cleaned up. And it's whether we can um, we can set ourselves onto a path where we can start, you know, we, where we can guarantee and and comfortably. Mm-hmm. comfortably guarantee to the public that, you know, when they hold a toco, that that toco really does truly um, represent one ton of, you know, carbon, you know, carbon mitigated. Right. I think, of course, the, the most legitimizing function in a currency always is, is the moment that, you know, jurisdictions or institutions accept it as tax. So, I, mm. you know, you asked me, we spoke about victory early, but, you know, in the evenings when I, when I dream about carbon currencies for the future and, you know, how this will be a model for us to actually create, you know, one coherent economic system that, you know, supports both, you know, human well-being, but respects planetary boundaries somehow. When I dream about that, I dream about the day that, you know, governments say, no, it's fine. What we will do is we'll just tax our citizens and our companies in Toko to enact our, to enact and use that as an instrument to enact our, our climate policy. Well, that will be that will be an interesting day, and I wish, wish you luck with that dream. Before, last thing before I let you go, I don't know if you had time to think about this. I mentioned, I think, in our, our first conversation, we often we ask everybody who comes on to the show uh, for uh, what we call catalysts, any things that they've read or watched or listened to or experienced that have helped shape, you know, their perceptions and their beliefs about climate and climate tech. So, if you have anything for our listeners, that would be great to share. Um, look, it's just an anecdotal, it's a, it's an anecdotal story that started me on, on this journey. And I'm not sure it's, I don't think it's inspirational in that sense, but it's definitely was my wake up sort of mm. moment. And that was, that was back in 2017. And I was at a, I, I went to a Swiss village in called Sars up in the, up in the Alps. And I went on a snowshoe and I went on a snowshoe hike and we just barely left town. And the gentleman who was leading, you know, was leading the tour group pointed to, to a cross that had been planted back in 1930. And that cross represented the point at, to which the glacier had extended to back in 19, <laughs> 1930. And the reason that that was such a such a moment for me is because I then you know had the privilege of looking up from the thousand eight hundred meters altitude that I was standing to, up to something like two thousand seven hundred meters, to where the glacier was today. Wow! And that, and just seeing the scale and the extent of that retreat, mm-hmm. the amount of energy that must have been input into that that system to create that kind of kind of melt was actually the first moment that it dawned on me that you know that climate change is very very real mm. and we might not all be experiencing it you know every day we see the you know events but that it is when you look at it at that time scale 1930 to now and you look at that amount of retreat it is that, that it is very very real and it is very, very large in, in scale. 
And yeah, I think that that for me was sort of a seminal moment, and it's actually what you know put me on the journey to investigate this and try to find solutions of of supporting the fight against climate change. Well, I think that everyone who works in the space has had a moment like that where they they just realize that you know they have to do something differently with the, you know, the talents that they have. So thanks for putting your talents into this, Joe, and I wish you the best of luck. Well, hopefully, you'll come back and give us an update about how things are going with the pilot. Yeah, we'll gladly do so. And thank you for having me. It's been, yeah, it's been an interesting, interesting time chatting to you. And it's always nice to talk about, you know, solutions and the fact that, you know, we actually do have the ability. It's in our hands. This, you know, this fight is not lost. It has just begun. Well, with that, I think we'll leave it there. Thank you so much, Joe Pretorius of the Carbon Reserve. Thank you, Richard. Keep well. Thanks for listening to Wicked Problems. And if you like this conversation, please share it and leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. It really helps people find the show. You can subscribe to our newsletter at news.wickedproblems.uk, where you can also find more episodes with Richard Elvin and Claire Brady and all our show notes. And consider becoming a paid subscriber to help support our work. You can also find us wherever you get your podcasts. For now, thanks for listening.